we're talking about selling elixir, usually it's a matter of meeting of the minds from the business side and the technology side. And sometimes you will find that they don't really care about what programming languages are the best or what technologies should be used. And the real reason really, in my opinion, is because of risk. So the matter of selling technology in itself is actually a matter of understanding risk management and, and approaching the problems through the lenses of uh, risk management. Um, in this very classic chart, um, what the chart says is basically, if a project is finished, then you know exactly how much it costs. If a project hasn't started, then the possibility of it going under or over budget is uh, very high. And as you progress through, through the time and get to more details, get to, more, uh, get to a further phase of implementation, the risk shrinks. So, so what you really want to do when you're selling a new technology is to try to reduce the size of the cone early in the process so as to make it more palatable to the business to get them to say, okay, we can do it and there are multiple ways to do it. So again, you will want to look at risk and value because depending on how large your project is, maybe it's one week or two weeks, or maybe it's one year or two years, the uh, actual potential value, i.e. how much money we expect to make, how much money we expect to save, is entirely different based on the uh, potential value. So when you're specifying a project, let's say uh, you have a site that has to go out two weeks later, and nobody knows Elixir, then in this case, you will probably not be able to sell Elixir because, because you will have to take more than two weeks to learn Elixir and you will go over the time allowed. So in that case, the potential value isn't really very high in doing that. So in execution, um, what you have to do is to reduce the value at risk. And by value at risk, uh, there are several uh, examples. For example, um, we know that we know Rails very well, so we have fixed like uh, we have fixed like character encoding issues in the database connection and whatever and whatever. So these things are basically the last ten, uh, last ninety percent after you have finished ninety percent of the work, and more understanding of the technology can reduce value at risk uh, during uh, during implementation. So lastly, there is the maintenance phase where um, sometimes people will tell you we don't want to use a stack which is obscure or less famous because we won't be able to hire people to maintain it. So what you can really say to these people is that if we have specified and built the project correctly, then you won't need to fire fight. And even if you need to add a new feature, you could take your time and learn how the code is written. And so the, uh, the difficulties in hiring really wouldn't be that severe. Anyway, so to Carry on to the next topic. There is a topic of complexity. Uh, I come from a software as a service business where usually there's an adage where we're saying that uh, the more features you have, the more customers you will get. But does more features mean more complexity? The answer is probably yes, probably no. It depends on how you have organized your application. And that is really another point of why Elixir could be a good sell because if you have a good tool to manage complexity without actually uh, having to write additional lines of code or to do dupli uh, duplicative work, then what you really have is leverage. So in this case, leverage can be thought of as a multiplier. You put in time, you spend resources, you get results. With good technology, uh, if you get better leverage through good technology, then several things can happen. One, you can ship faster, or two, you can ship more, or three, if the entire premise of the project was wrong, i.e. it's not possible to do it, then you can find out quicker, saving time, therefore reducing value at risk by committing less. Okay, so that's the precept of this talk. Now the background. So as I said, I come from a SaaS provider. We work in international education business, has been there since 2007. Um, the goal of the company is to support transition from paper because if you imagine an average admissions office and, and an average high school in, in the middle of the USA, uh, every year there will be a period where they're drawing in paper. Everybody sends in an application parcel from all, all over the world. People have to pay for postage and so on and so on. They're drawing in paper. So the goal of this company really is to support transition from paper and to do everything online and also do it without ever, ever asking the customers to talk with an IVR system. So you call somebody and somebody answers and that person is knowledgeable. That's basically the premise. And the team I work from is an UK branch for managed services. Um, 
So the definition of managed services, at least as I understand it, is that we build certain things for certain clients that are important, and we manage the operations of these applications for them. So they pay us, they get a service, and they use the service. That's basically it. And sometimes we do also spec writing. So uh, to have arrived at the precepts, we actually had two contexts. First and second context of OTP. And I'll tell you a little bit about, about these two contexts. The first contact, of course, is driven by the business. Basically, we had a lot of applications. And they kind of work with each other. And one day we decided, hey, if we, have, if we become an integrator, and integrate with other applications, then we could expand our customer lifetime value because then the customers will pay us for anything else that we upsell. But the downside for, uh, for being coming and integrated is that you now have to integrate. And anybody who has integrated multiple systems written by multiple teams in different time zones in different countries would understand how much of an undertaking it actually is. So anyway, one day we wrote a message broker in Ruby, which is a classic message bus architecture. And that really opened the door to OTP. So as to say, because we found certain niggling problems with the Ruby implementation. For example, um, lifecycle management is not, uh, isn't solid. We had to write custom code. And we had to do work sharding in a custom, uh, in a custom way. And in addition, we have a lot of error handlers everywhere to handle issues that would have been fixed by restarting. So, well, when you hear that, you would think, OK, OTP does it properly, doesn't it? Yes, OTP does it properly. Because we were very annoyed by it. And we wrote two prototypes to try and see if there are ways around it uh, to find a better solution. So we wrote two. The first one is Dre Ruby uh, based, which is uh, Ruby on a JVM. And we pull in a concurrent Ruby gem to, uh, to use uh, real threads and, and real actors to do the work. It, kind of worked fine. And then we wrote another one in Elixir, which used, uh, used OTP and its revision tree, which also worked fine even, even better. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, so we decided to sign a contract with somebody else and make it somebody else's problem. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, was, uh, that was not entirely successful. However, we still did a post-mortem. So in a post-mortem, we found out that we wouldn't be able to actually do it in Ruby anyway, because the performance bracket would be out of, out of reach of what we wanted. And in addition, this was not an issue that could have been fixed by having more, having more servers. Because what you can do with multiple servers is how you can handle additional workload, but you can't really shrink the amount of time or amount of resources each workload actually requires. So, so it was basically going to be dead in the water anyway. So that was what, what we learned. And we also, also found out about the ecosystems of, uh, around the JVM, around the Beam, res, uh, respectively. <laughs> so so after, uh, after the failed first contact, we sulked for a bit. And then we went for a second contact, which again was driven by the business. And in this case, it was driven not only by the business, but by a vendor. Basically, somebody came to us and said, hey, this service you have been using for three years is going away, three years, five years, or so on. And the replacement does it entirely differently. It stores data in an entirely different manner. It's not what you expected. So this um, drives us to look into a better solution, because, because it was very annoying from, from our internal perspective. Our VPE was furious and started thinking about, OK, we need to get out of, out of it. We don't want to reward this manner for, for um, taking a rug uh, under our feet. We want to make a buy versus build decision. This is when the second contact some, comes in, because uh, we went out to the vendors and we asked them, what can you do? So one, one, one vendor told us, yeah, give us $100,000, we'll, we'll try. And the second vendor told us, yeah, we can try to do it, but you've got to sign a contract first, and you don't get a trial before you sign a contract, which means that there is no trial. Or they offer a trial, but the trial is broken. And all sorts of issues uh, cropped up. It was quite an adventure, and not only an adventure in technical terms, but also an adventure in terms of culture. Because, as I said before, uh, the company I work for has a philosophy which is, if you want to try our software, go to this URL. The URL points to an application which resets every two hours. So you can do anything. Every single function is available. And you don't even have to call us. If you like it, then call us. So this is entirely different from, from what we have seen. And <laughs> And that was, that was terrible. And we also realized that if we have to do these pilot projects and, 
and so on, then basically we will have spent a lot of money and that money could have been used to actually internally build a prototype if we could. Basically, money is to be spent anyway, so why don't we spend it internally? So we look at several options. We can do SaaS, we can do COTS or commercial off the shelf, or we can do custom build. So this uh, is basically a cloud forming in the VPE's head. And one day we came to a mutual realizations. There are two. So one is, even if we buy something, we have to put it into our application and we have to integrate it. And if we, if we found something that was missed during feasibility studies, we'll have to try to fix it. And if we don't have the source code, we cannot fix it. We have, to we have to ask other people to fix it. And as a provider of services, we know that when customers tell us to do something, we don't always do it because, because it might not be worth our while. And this same situation can also occur um, to us when we ask our vendors to do something. So, so we decided that, okay, let's do a custom thing. But as I said before, during the first few minutes, uh, during the precepts, when you start doing a custom thing, then all the risk management ideas come into play. So our proposal will have to be crafted in a way that is palatable and actually realistically uh, uh, show a reduced, uh, reduced risk during design, implementation, and operations. So um, well, what we did was we spent a week and we made a prototype that works end to end and we deployed it and then we attach it to a proposal. So, so the proposal was accepted and that was the story of our second contact with OTP which was successful. Um, now I want to take a few minutes to talk about what we have learned on uh, transitioning to OTP. This is going to be brief because multiple teams have done this transition before already. So um, basically four major components, Rails Assets Pipeline, Action Cable, and Active Record. Uh, we like all of, the, uh, all of the available options currently available uh, on the beam. So especially for the Assets Pipeline, um, the improvement in uh, compiling assets is very remarkable. So another thing is that there are several tasks that may, uh, may be done or may not be done by the party libraries. We have cases where we have to make something else and well, I don't want to run an image magic process out of process and I don't want to run the FFI inside a Bing, so we had to do a C program and customize it, but we managed to do it and then we managed to open source it. So um, basically, difficult things are possible, easy things are easy in, in Bing land. Okay. So now, closing thoughts. I'll spend a few minutes here as well. Again, uh, from the stories, you can see that most of the problems you may face uh, in selling a project, a technology, and so on can be viewed through different lenses. And there are four lenses I would like to talk about. The first one is the nature of the problem, whether it's a wicked problem or a normal problem. And by a wicked problem, um, well, it's more of a non-technology uh, term, but in technology, you can think of a wicked problem as a problem that nobody knows a precise solution to. In order to find out the solution to a wicked problem, you have to have multiple tries, and each try may get you closer or further away. So, wicked problems are like, okay, the customer wants this thing, but they cannot articulate, and so on and so on. These are wicked problems. If a problem is wicked, then you have to make sure you plan for iterations, and you gradually transform the wicked parts into righteous parts that are easily definable and have easy answers. Um, the second thing is the organization of your team, whether your team is large and require, a, uh, basically whether you want to keep a large team or, or keep a small team. Because, well as you know, when you add more people to your team, the uh, communication overhead goes up. So. In certain cases, the solution is if you have multiple teams that don't, don't talk together and then make each team make a microservice. But um, you may want to look into different options other than, uh, other than having discrete code bases and discrete teams. And lastly, there's one, thing, one more thing which can be used uh, when you're trying to sell, which is a mode of control. This is another old idea. There are three different kinds of modes of controls. Um, free market forces, contractual obligations, or cultural values, and I'll explain them. Basically, uh, this is a two by two. Uh, horizontally, you have the CUA factor as in complexity, uncertainty, and ambiguity. So 
uh, vertically, you have whether people are more self-interested or more group-oriented. And these are basically, basically the classic t uh, archetypes of workplaces, if you could say so. So contractual obligations mean do this or you are fired. And usually it will work if you know precisely what is to be done. If you have written an interface and want an implementation, then you can do that. And if people are offering themselves, and this is free market forces, but usually you will find yourself and your team probably in high CUA, which, uh, which means that you're in a startup and things change every day. Uh, it's always in flux, and in these cases, the only solution that works will be to impose cultural values, i.e. a set of guidelines that people share. So you may want to think about it. In conclusion, um, in conclusion, in selling elixir, uh, concretely, you may have several objections coming your way, and I'll call these things perceptions. So, for example, you can have you can have somebody object and say the perception is that this is uh, this is new technology, this is unproven, but in reality, what they're probably thinking is that there is an implementation risk. We may not be able to finish the project, and so what you can do to address this uh, niggling problem is by having an early end-to-end -end prototype. Having a prototype which is working proves that the technology is feasible. And if the prototype has good out-of-the-box performance and has uh, bits addressed like how, how it's to be deployed, how it's to be integrated, as long as you have all these things addressed, then you will have de-risk a little bit more. And that will be fine. However, the prerequisite here is that you must have first ensure that your team does have time to experiment and learn. Otherwise, you will never have time to do unscheduled work like this. And if you don't have any time to do unscheduled work, then you will never have uh, an opportunity to, to make a prototype. And you will never have opportunity to sell a new, a new piece of technology unless you have explicit backing, which is not when you want to learn how to sell technology. <laughs> so another thing is maybe, well, the technology is not standard, i.e. everybody is writing Java. Why are you writing this weird thing? So this actually would be more of an ego problem. And, or say this is more related to the perceived complexity in IT governance. So, because basically you're making the IT managers' life very hard by forcing them to learn what this technology can do, and some people like it, some people don't. And you can take time to try to persuade them to like it, but, well, sometimes you can't. The real solution is to have cultural change, and it has to be bottom up. And in certain cases, uh, if you follow the skunk work model, what you can do is you have, if you have demo uh, demonstrated successes in the past that uh, you do whatever you, you say you will do, and the things that you have done are precisely as you said, and so on, i.e. your key performance indicators are all met, then you may have more leeway in pushing these things and eventually arriving at cultural change. The last bit is on, um, obscurity of a technology, which is a different thing from non-standard. So in terms of obscurity, I'm more talking about uh, the lack of people who know a bit, a bit of technology, i.e. how many resumes, how many CVs we see every day has this keyword. So this is actually a silly problem to begin with because inside, uh, if you look at how long it takes to hire a new person and to train a person to maintain the software stack, it may take a few months, a few weeks to a few months for a person to actually learn first how, what a system does and then start coding. So the syntax or technology itself actually is just but a minor part of maintenance. And in addition, if you have a constantly available professional development budget, then you could have trained people constantly and you wouldn't have run out of people to maintain your software applications. So, of course, the prerequisite is you have to know where the community is in order to send people to the right places. Okay, so I think I spent about 19 minutes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.